This time on Supersize Grime, the block of flats that's too dangerous to demolish. This has made the job ten times as big, ten times as hard and ten times as dangerous. Mixing water and electricity to keep the grid nice and clean. And we're going on to the live end at 275,000 volts. Giant piles of steaming dung. Picking all the poo up, as you can tell, takes the breath out of your pit. And the huge hole filled with stuff from your bin. This is five million cubic metres of airspace. But first, in Greenock, near Glasgow, there's a massive job. 48 derelict flats used for years by squatters and drug takers need to be cleared and made safe in just seven days. But no one is sure exactly what the job involves. Lewis Fordham is first in to conduct a survey. Just about to do a site survey. Don't know what's lying ahead of us, so let's go and see what we can find. It looks pretty bad. And with 48 flats, it's one of the biggest jobs he's taken on. Now power on a building, meters off. Lots of debris for the ceiling come down. I'd imagine that the local scrap merchant's been in. Thanks to the high price of copper, everything metal has been stripped from the flats and sold for scrap, and they've been left in a dangerous condition. OK, big hole there, that's where they go down and find other treasures. The reason for the lack of power soon becomes clear. You can see here the meters and fuse boxes have been stripped there. Someone stole the electricity meter. This is, uh, unfortunately, a pretty typical site that we've got. When the guys get in before we do, strip her out, make the conditions really hazardous, dangerous to work in, uh, all for a few pounds. Nice mess in here. Lewis has seen it all before. Uh, I've got chests, same mirrors I've got in my house. All right, that's a bad one. You know, there's a lot of stuff going to be moved here, there's a lot piled up here, a lot of hazards. It's challenging, but it's a, a job that we can take um, quite easily and quite successfully. But as he moves through the flats, that view is about to change. Ah, I like a wee drink. Oh. Now you watch here, I can see some telltale signs of drug abuse. Yep, there we go. A couple of Hypodermics, tin foil. Uh, so that means this flat's been used as some sort of drug user's den. The job's just got a whole lot bigger and tougher. I've got another 45 that possibly could contain this, so this changes everything, how we work and how we operate. Oh, God. It smells in here. I think they've used this room as some sort of toilet. <coughs> Sodden mattress. If you're thinking this might make a nice first step on the property ladder, forget it. These flats are way beyond repair and a magnet for drug users. They'll have to be demolished, but not until Lewis and his team have made them safe. Roof's been leaking. Lewis finds evidence that some of this grime has been here for decades. Oh, oh nice one. The old tenants lager they cans. You can see how long this property's potentially been empty. Um, used to like their cans looking at the, the nice woman. Get you something to look at. Scotland used to go mental for them and used to pick their own sort of lady that they would drink with. Um, certainly brings back memories. Lewis is keen to point out that he wasn't drinking in the 70s. Obviously, I'm a bit young to be drinking at that type of can, but uh, I remember my father, etc., going mental for that type of can. Um, I have memories. As he moves through the flats, Lewis realises they contain some serious hazards. We've got a pigeon here, uh, one of our feral friends, another uh, problem that we've got to deal with, another hazard. Oh well, you can clearly see this flat's been on fire. Another hazard to the job. Quite extensive fire. Um... If the fires damage the building structure, that's a major hazard for Lewis and his team. So as you can see here, uh, the fire's been obviously creating some heat and started melting all the electrical goods. So as we've seen, that's as we've had fires, we've had vermin, uh, needles, 
Um, 48 flats should do. Really mammoth task in front of us. Uh, massive. The job is far bigger and more dangerous than Lewis originally thought, and that's a problem. We've got to clear nine of these properties a day, uh, and if we fail, then it's going to have an, uh, an effect on the contractors coming in behind us. So, you know, the pressure's on. Hinkley Point Nuclear Power Station on the Bristol Channel. This is the 275 kV substation, handling enough electricity to run a city half the size of Bristol. It's live and running at 275,000 volts. But unless action is taken immediately, this substation is about to fail. Salt blown off the sea is building up. It's forming an invisible layer on the brown porcelain insulators. It's going to cause a flashover. An electrical spark will leak from the live bars to the ground. The flashover will shut down the substation. Making sure this doesn't happen are Frank, James and Pete. Their job is to clean the salt from the substation without closing it down. Now, we all know you shouldn't mix electricity and water, but these three men are about to squirt lots of water at a live electricity substation running at 275,000 volts. It's imperative that we keep the insulators clean. Those insulators are the brine porcelains that you see suspending the buzz bars. We're right near the coast, uh, off the Bristol Channel here. We get a lot of salt pollution and that salt pollution builds up and uh, one thing that we do not want, we can ill afford, is a flashover. So this is why we're carrying out this water washing. Because this is a genuinely risky operation, it's vital all parties at Hinkley Point agree that it's safe to proceed. Hey, Mr. Thompson. Frank needs to get formal permission to proceed with the wash. Well, that's giving us permission now to wash. So it's under our control now. Washing a live substation can cause a dreaded flashover, so they try to reduce the risk. The man at the sharp end is Pete. Yeah, it's going to be coming out about uh, £80 per square inch. Um, yeah, on the 275,000 volts. As he washes, Pete will stand on an earth platform. You've got the earth cable going under the earth. The jet comes out for the, the front. This is uh, just applying the earth now, um, which goes from the monitor, and it goes on one of these strips of what we've got going down for the entire substation. So that just clamps on. One further precaution, the gloves. Um, well, they're 1,000 volt gloves. Um, so obviously it protect you at a thousand volts, but apart from that, not a lot more really. With his thousand volt gloves on, Pete's ready to wash. I've got to give a signal to Frank. When I give him the signal, you turn the water on, and then we've got to wait for the, the pipes to charge. I get the indication on the gauge that we're up to the correct pressure, and then I can start washing. When the pressure reaches 80, Pete will send a jet of water onto the live 275,000 volt conductor. Coming up on Super Size Grime, the giant hole eating up 1,000 tons of rubbish a day. They're ready to wash the 275,000 volt substation. This is absolutely critical. And cleaning up after the world's biggest land animal. They are very dirty animals. We're following the teams with the biggest and dirtiest jobs in the land. Coming up, the pressure is building for the team washing a live electricity substation. And at Britain's biggest zoo, a mammoth mountain of steaming poo, now it has to be shifted. But first, a supersized problem we're all part of. When we dump our unrecyclable rubbish in a bin or a skip, it's a messy problem solved. Out of sight, out of mind. It's no longer our problem. But it is a problem for the guys running a huge landfill site near Ipswich in Suffolk. This is the actual active tipping area. The waste keeps coming in a never-ending convoy. 
Every day, there are 90 trucks wanting to dump a 1,000 tonnes of waste. Yeah, we get a mix of vehicles in here. We get um, dust carts from the local councils. We get Arctics from transfer stations, um, skip lorries from transfer stations. We also get um, small trade vehicles. On a stay. As soon as the waste is off the truck, it has to be worked on to contain it. Problem one, it takes up too much space. Wherever the compactor is, is where they know where they got a tip. Meet the compactor. 45 tonnes of heavy metal. The compactor marauds over the newly dumped junk. It breaks up the garbage and crushes it so that it takes up less space. And it creates a firm surface, good for trucks to drive on while it's a dump, and a solid foundation for when this is eventually transformed into useful land. Meet the Mad Max of Suffolk. It's Ralph Brakes. I'm a plant operative. This is a, a Bomag 45 tonne landfill compactor. The engine produces over 500 horsepower, but top speed through the three speed gearbox is just 10 miles an hour. Operation is pretty simple. You have your steering lever, you have accelerator, you have the blade. Instead of suspension, the body pivots to cope with the rough terrain. Its key features are the spiked metal wheels designed to crush and compact up to a 1,000 tonnes of landfill waste a day. However you dress it up, a landfill site is essentially a hole in the ground. And to be useful, it has to be a big one. This is five million cubic metres of airspace. It's one of the biggest holes in the UK. It used to be a quarry, and at one time, waste would simply have been dumped into the hole. But not anymore there's a big and potentially dangerous problem, flammable methane gas. One tonne of landfill could produce 500 cubic metres of gas, so they have to fix the hole. What we do is take a, a section of the site, we line it, and what that does is not only protect the surrounding environment, but make the site work for us. We can draw off the gas, burn the methane in the gas to produce good renewable power. The site here is producing up to five megawatts of capacity of that um, electricity, and that's enough to provide the domestic needs of about nine and a half thousand homes. Although 250,000 homes feed their waste into the site, even with the trash compacted into a giant rubber-lined hole and the flammable gas burned to make electricity, the problems of landfill are not yet over. Unless action is taken, some of the rubbish will try to escape. At Hinkley Point Nuclear Power Station on the banks of the Bristol Channel, the cleaning team is about to mix salt, water and an awful lot of electricity. They're cleaning the live 275,000 volt substation that connects the power station to the grid. Salt blown from the sea lets the electricity flash over to the ground. If that happens, the substation shuts down. The invisible layer of salt has to be washed off. OK, so I'm going to give a signal to Frank. Standing on an electrically earth platform, Pete waits for the water pressure to build up. So the gauge will come up somewhere between 80 and 100 pounds per square inch. It's on 80 now, so I can start. Pete's starting to wash. He does it in a certain sequence. Uh, it's imperative that the overspray goes onto clean insulators. That's just a bit of air in the pipe. That's nothing to worry about. Pete's checked the wind direction so that spray from the wash only blows onto insulators he's already cleaned. If it landed on salt-covered insulators, the spray would become salty and dangerously conducting. The water that's jetting out of there is coming out of a pressure of about 80 psi. And with the nozzle, it's all been calculated that it forms very fine droplets. With the water in separate droplets rather than a continuous jet, it's harder for electricity to track back to Pete. This prevents Pete from getting a flashover back to him. It's, this is absolutely critical and part of the safety checks and monitoring that Pete has to do whilst he's washing. And then we're coming on to the earth end and we're going on to the live end at 275,000 volts. For most of us, squirting salty water over a high-end electrical installation would be a high-tension activity. For the Hinkley Point team, it's become a regular appointment. Well, it's done on a routine basis throughout the winter months between November and March. 
we tend to do this washing once every week. But in the summer months, the problem doesn't seem such a big issue. So it's done once every two weeks. And time has taught us that that seems to be about the right level of washing that's required. The wash appears to be safely underway, but conditions can change unexpectedly. The conductivity of the water is monitored and it's being constantly monitored. If the conductivity, that means the purity of the water, falls below a certain level and it becomes too conductive, the procedure stops. You've got a 15 second uh, time frame. You get an alarm, you know then to stop washing and the pumps will then shut down automatically. In addition to that, the pressure at which the water is delivered at 80 PSI must be maintained. If that drops off, again, the, the whole system will shut down. The 275,000 volt substation wash is nearly finished. Over two days, the team has used thousands of litres of water to safely remove salt from the electrical systems. But the power station is not yet safe. Next door is a second substation. It is also caked in salt from the Bristol Channel and must be cleaned. But this one runs at 400,000 volts and is far too dangerous for the team to wash. At 600 acres and with over 4,000 animals, Whipsnade is Britain's biggest zoo. It's also a huge faeces factory and the supersized steaming piles have to be cleaned up. Among the biggest and most enthusiastic poo producers are the Asian elephants. I would guess we probably remove somewhere between 500 and 1,000 kilos a, a day of faeces from the elephants. And we'll probably get through at least a, a three tonne dumper load when we're doing that. An adult elephant makes about 50 kilos or 80 pounds of faeces a day. Picking all the poo up, as you can tell, takes the breath out of your pet. Elephants eat around 250 kilos of food every day, but they digest less than half of that, which is why there's so much dung. The faeces itself gets taken away by a local farmer, so it's obviously very useful manure on his fields. And with us, although faeces isn't particularly exciting to most people, we take a good look at the faeces because that can tell us a little bit about the condition of the elephant, but also you're looking for any parasites um, that we need to treat. Elephant dung smells OK if the elephant's healthy, and survival types claim that if you squeeze it, the water in elephant dung is quite drinkable. The keepers also have to clean the world's biggest land animal itself. Weighing up to 10,000 pounds, an adult could be hard to handle, but there's a trick. You just have to ask nicely. Fridge will lie down. Lie down. Good boy. So naturally, they're, they are very dirty animals. They're, they're animals that would roll in mud naturally in the wild, so they do like to get dirty and throw things onto their back. In the wild, elephants would take mud baths or fully immerse themselves in rivers or water holes. The pampering they get at Whipsnade replaces their natural cleaning routine. This is tea tree soap, um, it's animal soap, and it just makes it easier as we run the brush over his skin. It just makes it easier on him. We probably get through about five litres of that a week. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important because obviously you get the grease off of them as well. Um, in case they have laid down in, in something particularly nasty, it just helps clean them a little bit easier for us. And it makes them smell nice. What we tend to use is the, is the hot water pressure washers because it, it, it seems to clean them a lot easier for, for us, really. The one of the few animals, really, that you're constantly cleaning up after. By the time we bath one, they could have been a toilet at least four times just during a bathing session because of the warm water has an effect of relaxing them, so they tend to kind of empty their bowels quite a bit when we're washing them. So, the bowels working A-OK. -okay. Good. The bath is a chance to check other elephant systems too. The real point of the exercise is, is two things really. One of them is to build a relationship with the elephant and also is to check the elephant over from head to toe. You're scrubbing every part of them so you're seeing any problems that may be there. We can make sure that there is no health issues whatsoever. and We can even check their mouth, we can take blood if we need to. It just enables us to have all the sort of tools in our arsenal to make sure that they're looked after the best they can be. 
Not all the elephants are taking this cleaning seriously. He's just bollocking around with his brother, to be honest, and I almost wonder whether it's me getting you in cleaner or him getting in more dirty. I would say, and obviously I'm very biased, but it's the best job in the zoo without a doubt. Bath over, it's back to the business of getting dirty again. So we just brought them out from their bath, and as you can see straight away, they're covering themselves with sand. Well, I almost think that they do it on purpose, so we have to clean it off in the mornings. But the elephant excrement they collect at Whipsnade is the start of another massive problem. The growing mound is decomposing and getting hotter by the day. And another huge animal is about to make it even bigger. Coming up, the drug den flats get more dangerous. This has made the job 10 times as big, 10 times as hard, and 10 times as dangerous. Stopping the landfill stench from invading nearby homes. That's very similar to the air freshers that you have at home, but on a massive scale. And a mountain of overheating excrement. The supersized grime teams are about to reach the heart of the filth. Coming up, in Greenock, dangers wait around every corner in a block of abandoned flats. A mountain of steaming rhino poo hits the road. And in Bristol, a second salty substation at a far higher voltage. We can't manually wash here, it's just not safe to do so. But first, in Greenock, Lewis has unearthed a super-sized problem lurking in a block of 48 flats. He's supposed to clear them so that a demolition team can go in. But his inspection revealed not only tons of junk, but fire damage, vermin, dangerous holes in the floors, and even human waste. It smells in here. I think they've used this room as some sort of toilet. <coughs> but the worst problem is hundreds of needles abandoned by drug users. The risk of disease means these will have to be cleared before anything else can be shifted. He's breaking the bad news to the team. Gents, uh, massive task ahead of us. 48 flats, there's needles, pigeons. So there's a whole combination of all sorts of hazards in there. We've got seven days to turn that round, guys, so we need to be on the money. First in is Frankie. He soon discovers the boss wasn't exaggerating. Right, guys, in the corner here, we've got a shooting gallery. Really bad. But first of all, watch yourself in the wall here. We've got a dirty protest. This is a bad bit of the job. It does turn my stomach with these needles lying about. But you, what you have to remember is a needle won't jump up and bite you. As long as you're careful, it is safe. Many of these needles will have come from the free needle exchange programmes, meant to keep injecting drug users safe. But if the used needles are left lying about, they become a danger for whoever has to clean them up. This is what we're up against. This is what slows you up. We have 40-odd houses to do, and obviously you just can't steam in there. This is all too common. Boulders that are lying derelict for so long, this is what happens. If you're going to clear derelict houses around here, you have to be aware of the medical dangers. There's always a threat of like, hepatitis, whether it's B or C. Always AIDS problems. Um, so like there's some here. There we go. The more you look, the more you find. Don't know why they don't make them glow in the dark. It'd make their job a lot easier and a lot safer. This was always a massive job, but the huge number of needles and the dangers of disease they bring has seriously slowed the lads down. Uh, it can be pretty soul destroying. It uh, just seems never ending when you've got as many rooms. Education campaigns mean the incidence of HIV AIDS among drug users has been going down, but hepatitis, especially hepatitis C, has been on the increase. The lads have no choice but to check for needles before starting the job of clearing the junk. Possibly a lot of needles here. Yeah. Just got to pick our way through it and hopefully get it done by the week. The week's out. Or Louis's going to kick her ass. James has found some other drug paraphernalia. So the citrus packets. These are all issued to the drug users. Citric acid packs are issued to heroin users to help dissolve heroin for injection. Without it, they use acids like lemon juice, which gets infected. It can cause heart problems and blindness. Once again, it's James and his colleagues clearing up. 
there's always the worry that we maybe miss something. James knows that you also need to worry about the needles you can't see. Sometimes they like to hide the needles. So when you don't find it the first time, you don't really want to find it the wrong way. And sure enough, hidden behind the cushions is another stash. Oh, hidden behind the couch. So we're probably going to have to strip the couch out, check inside, because uh, sometimes they just like to stuff needles down behind the cushions. This could be repeated in each of the 48 flats. That we might, we might be a bit off more than we can chew here. Um, but just got to stay positive and just get on with it. Lots of work has been done, but not a single flat has been cleared. The arrival of two big skips means that at last the lads can move on to the next phase of the job. The first room is clear of needles, so furniture and junk can at last be cleared out. But it's still painfully slow as the team works around the other dangers of the Greenock flats. Obviously, another hazard we've got to deal with every day is these big holes in the floor, and we've got to carry items across these holes, and it's pretty dangerous. Even without the extra dangers, there's just a whole lot of lifting and carrying ahead of them. It takes you out here, about 54 stairs to go up and down about 100 times a day, so I'm 47 and nearly dead, so it's, my premature death is coming. Assuming that doesn't happen in the next hour or so, Ian and the lads will have reached the end of the first day, and it's been a bit depressing. A bit disappointed the skip isn't full, but we have had to go slow looking for the needles. You know, I'm sure people will understand. Tomorrow morning, a new day, new dawn. Bring it on. At a landfill near Ipswich in Suffolk, Ralph is crushing waste into a giant hole using his 45-ton Bomag compactor. But they've got a problem. People live not far from the site, and no matter how compact the waste is, with the wind in the wrong direction, it will smell awful. What they need is a giant can of air freshener. This is the odour suppression system. Um, we've got an adjacent village nearby. Um, in case there's any odours on site at all, we switch the system on um, and it sprays a fragrant smell into the air. It's very similar to the air fresheners that you have at home, but on a massive scale, so you can imagine that it lets off a, a smell around the site. Can put whatever fragrance you want in there, but um, at the moment we got strawberry. The waste produces not only smelly gases, but unpleasant liquids too. And if they ran off the site or percolated down into drinking water supplies, the results could be disastrous. The black membrane lining the landfill stops the liquids escaping. On top of the membrane, there is a drainage system. What we're standing at is the drainage level yeah. so that all the liquid that percolates down through the waste can be captured at a low point, pumped out and safely disposed of via sewage treatment works. The liquid's known as leachate. If you can imagine your um, black wheelie bin at home, if it's been sitting around for a week or two, the brown sludgy liquid that gathers at the bottom of it, that's what it is. A scientist who'd worked in the industry for many years once told me, if you had a pint of leachate to give an idea of the hazardousness, if you drank it, it would make you probably queasy and a bit sick, but it wouldn't make you ill in the long term. Do not try this at home. Notice that Dan isn't actually drinking a pint of leachate either. The systems to deal with flammable gas, smells and unpleasant liquids don't end the problems. Even the solid waste can go walk about, or rather fly about. The problem is hundreds of seagulls. They pick up large pieces of rubbish and uh, they spread it around not just this site but also the surrounding community. But that won't happen on this tip if Paul Morris does his job. I am the uh, bird controller here and uh, I clear the site of uh, gulls. This is, uh, I, I call her Wobbles. She's a, a peregrine cross with a saker. But Wobbles isn't just for show. Once in a while, she gives the gulls a proper lesson. The gulls react to the peregrine's shape and back off. Usually, the deterrent effect is enough. But sometimes, she'll make a kill. She'll do a, a circuit of the site. If she's caught something, then I'll have to track her down with uh, my tracking equipment and then um, and see where she is. It is necessary now and again for, for the birds to catch the birds on here so that they, they get in, you know, into the routine of knowing that there is something 
dangerous on the site. Wobbles the Falcon. Another soldier in the battle against crime. At Hinkley Point Electrical Substation, the veteran cleaning team of Pete, James and Frank is well underway with the water wash. They're washing salt from the vital insulators and jetting water directly onto the live 275,000 volt conductor. These guys have done a great job. It's taken two days to wash this substation. They've washed 250 stacks. This means that this site will run safely and reliably for the next couple of weeks without any problems. But now they must turn to the 400,000 volt substation. The higher voltage means it's even more likely to flash over when electricity flashes to the earth like a mini lightning bolt. But the extremely high voltage would make a manual wash far too dangerous. We can't manually wash here, it's just not safe to do so. We've got an automatic water wash system that runs totally independently, requires no manual input and it can operate any time and it makes a decision when it needs to wash. At the heart of the system is an automatic pollution monitor. A section of insulator has been hanging in the salty wind. Now it's going to be tested. This is one of two pollution detectors. This is known as the West Zone Pollution Detector. The other one's on the east side of the substation. This is picking up the deposits of salt that are blown across from the channel. Once it reaches a certain level, it will initiate a wash. There's no manual intervention. It's all done automatically, any time of the day any day of the week. Unlike a manual wash, this system can run every two hours, day and night. And if a 400,000 volt flashover does happen, there won't be a man on the receiving end. Hinkley Point Power Station uses the sea for cooling water, but that puts its substations in the way of the salty air from the Bristol Channel. So, for over 25 years, Frank and the team have been doing something you should never do at home, mixing electricity and water to keep the power flowing smoothly. At Whipsnade, a big contributor to the Dung Mountain is the White Rhino. Today, the steaming pile has to be shifted, all 17 tonnes of it. First, they're going to shovel up last night's contribution. If I've had a rough night and I've had a few fights and that, the bed can be everywhere. But today it's quite neat. Just like humans then, eh? They always seem to defecate in one place, which makes it easier for us. Yeah, also like humans. Rhino keeper Craig Wright has a bit of history behind him. I've been working with him for 18 years. I'm the uh, fourth generation of keeper in my family. My great granddad actually put the fences up because um, before Whipsnade was a zoo, it was a farm. And my great granddad actually worked on the farm and put the fences up to become the zoo and walked all the animals from Luton Station. You heard right. The animals walked from Luton Station. When Whipsnade opened in 1931, they were short of animals. They purchased a travelling menagerie. It was probably those animals Craig's granddad helped walk to the zoo. The poo isn't all taken away. They mix some with straw to make a heat bed. The rotting faeces helps to keep the rhinos nice and warm. But now the Whipsnade faeces mountain has reached overwhelming proportions and it has to go. In charge of shifting the pachyderm pile is Steve White. There's only so much that we can store, so then Darren's just come in today and he's going to take it back to his farm. The lucky recipient is a local farmer. Darren Maskell. Right. Yeah, not too bad. bad. Got another nice load for you. Right. Last year, there were 295 tonnes of rhino dung alone. In a pile, it soon heats up until it's steaming. Left for too long, it can spontaneously catch fire. In California, in 2007, a pile of manure is thought to have caused a 175-acre fire that took 400 firefighters to control. It helps the uh, crops grow. It's got a little bit of nitrogen in it. It's got nutrients. Um, helps improve the soil quality. And we can put a um, bit less um, artificial fertiliser on. 
so it's better for the environment. Before Darren started collecting Whipsnade's excess excrement, it had to be sent to landfill. Now it's here, we'll get the muck spreader in after harvest and we'll um, load it up with an excavator and spread it on the fields and that'll help next year's crops grow. Watch out for super-sized crops in the Whipsnade area. Coming up in the battle against super-sized grime, how to turn rubbish into money. 96 to 97% will be recycled from what you can see out of this. And it's a race to clear the 48 flats. I don't know if part to skip there, but it's about 50 yards too far away. Time is running out for the teams tackling Britain's supersized grime. Coming up, life on the picking line recycling our rubbish. And in Greenock, it's a battle to shift tons of rubbish from dangerous abandoned flats. But first, the good people of Suffolk are sending 90 truckloads or 1,000 tonnes of rubbish every day to be tipped and compacted into a 5 million cubic metre hole in the ground as landfill. But everyone knows this can't go on forever. Landfill is the past, recycling is the future. On the other side of the site, there's a different tipping operation going on. Another supersized pile of waste for someone to deal with. But this waste is going to be turned into money. 96 to 97% will be recycled from what you can see out of this. This great pile is worthless rubbish unless it can be separated into different materials. It's mixed cans, bottles, paper and packaging, but these guys are about to sort it out with a combination of very high and very low tech. The recycling plant is like a vast machine with humans working alongside the technology, and it can only make money if it's quick. It is a fast moving machine. We are actually hitting about 19 to 20 tonne an hour. Once they've got rid of textiles, wood, and things you shouldn't put in your recycling bin, the machines get to work. First, the trommel, a big drum that gets rid of the small stuff. Suddenly, it starts to get a bit technical. Anything sub 45 mil will go to landfill. Anything from 180 to 180 will go on to the ballistics. Ballistics sorts out the lighter paper from the heavier packaging. This is the, the main cabin, the main pick cabin. In theory, the waste should now be separated into three types, but the machines aren't that good. In the picking cabin, pickers re-sort stuff that's on the wrong line. Finally, there's mixed paper, news and pamps, and 3D, which is bottles and cans. Next process is the overhead magnets. As you can see, it takes the steel cans off. The next process is the eddy currents, and that takes off the aluminium. The biggest challenge is separating plastics into different types, and this is really high-tech. That's all done by camera recognition. The camera spots a particular sort of plastic bottle. Then, as it leaves the machine, a quick blast of air sends it in the right direction. It's a clever bit of kit, really. Here's where it all ends up. In bales of paper, aluminium, steel and plastics that someone wants to buy. Today, another 250 tonnes of waste has gone from wheelie bin to wheelie valuable. Do you see what I did there? This is the future. But what about the future of the landfill? It's also being turned into something else. We can restore landfills to heathland, to woodland, to farmland. You can graze animals on it, you can grow crops on it. Um, here we're creating habitat for local wildlife. But it won't be handed back to Suffolk until all danger of further pollution has passed. And that could take decades. Greenock, near Glasgow. It's early morning and the extreme cleaning team tackling a wrecked block of 48 flats is hoping for better progress. Their first day was slowed down by hundreds of dirty used needles left behind by drug users. Even without needles, they know today won't be any easier. 
Yeah, this is one of the worst rooms we've got to deal with. It's fire damaged. Just removing these boards so we can get a bit more light inside. The fire damaged room isn't a pretty sight. Now we've got the window boards off, you can actually see what a state this is. Yeah, I'll have to make sure the floorboards are intact, uh, take away the ceiling, it's dropped down obviously. We'll have to shovel all this debris away before we can even think about moving all this safely out the door. Uh, it's going to be a long, slow, drawn out process. The fallen ceiling could be hiding dangerous holes in the floor. They're desperately hoping it doesn't also hide yet more needles. That is really bad news. There we go. Worst fears for in here. I can count at least six needles there. Cooking up spoons down there. This has made the job ten times as big, ten times as hard, and ten times as dangerous. But they have no choice. Proceed with extreme caution. Just need to play it by ear. Clearing the flats has turned into a race against time. They won't get back the days lost to needle clearing. With 48 flats to get through, this is a huge job. But it's going from technical and hazardous to old fashioned hard physical graft. At last, there are some rooms ready to clear. It's a bit of a mess, this one, boys, I think. Clearly. First, to remove all the large furniture. Well, usual three floors up, couches, units. It's just normal, but could do without it this time of day, basically. Getting bulky furniture through narrow stairwells and doors is bound to be slow. It doesn't help that the skip isn't where they expected it to be. I don't know if part to skip there, but it's about 50 yards too far away. <laughs> At last, they're shifting some real tonnage, though it's not obvious how some of this stuff got into the flats in the first place. Although Ian's an old hand at the cleaning game now, he didn't always find it easy. I didn't like the smells at first, but... It's... Well, I don't, still don't like the smells, don't get me I've not created a passion for them. Each team member has something they dread finding in their personal room 101. People's false teeth, that's a killer for me. I reckon probably the, when it comes to cleaning up the pigeons mess. With the drug paraphernalia gone, the giant skips finally get filled. Rooms you couldn't get into return to something like normal. There's one final task. Seal the building up to make sure no one can get in again before it's demolished. When the boss returns, he knows his team has had a hard week. It was a big push with all my guys. We've done about 10. Uh, the big skips, that's about 40 tonne, approximately. And I'll tell you what, I'm relieved that's over. Next time on Supersize Grime, the underground cavern filled with fat. It's just solid fatberg. The men facing danger from deadly asbestos waste. And on board a ferry with just 45 minutes to clean up after 2,000 passengers. And it just gets um, the grime and the body fat off the walls. <laughs>